if you've come along to uh, wonder about involving teachers in educational or research, there's lots of, way to involve, lots of ways of involving teachers, and I'm only going to do one of them. Okay, if you want to know how to involve teachers in uh, questionnaire research, etc., we can have a chat about that at some stage. Okay, but I'm going to talk about a thing called teacher inquiry today, uh, something that you're very familiar with, I'm sure. And because I thought... Uh, well, I'm actually addressing... You can pretend you're graduate students again, all right, you old people, uh, uh, and, and take it in that, in that light. There's a really good paper uh, by Mishler. It's an old paper, but I just love the title. The paper's a beautiful paper in any case. And this was written during what was called the Paradigm Wars, that big war between qualitative, quantitative research, etc. Meaning in context, is there any other kind? It's a beautiful, beautiful quote. So I, I, I encourage you to have a look at that if you haven't got it in your library in any case. Why do I bring that up now? Because you need to know a couple of things. There's contextual factors that you need to know about to make sense of what I'm going to say today. Okay? I was, uh, believe it or not, for 11 and a half years, a high school teacher in Australia. Uh, I went to East Doncaster High School. This is my high school. Most high schools in Melbourne are only one story high, as you notice this photograph. It's quite different to um, Vancouver here. Uh, I taught there for 11 and a half years. I taught math, computer science and physical education. And I, I don't have many photographs from those days. It was amazing. I mean, I'm very old, obviously, close to retirement. Yeah. So I had to really go through. Here I am standing on the uh, front yard of the school. Uh, but I did actually lose weight uh, sometime later. Uh, and if you're beginning to worry about this particular uh, education that I had, these are my year 12 students uh, in computer science. So that gives you a sense of where I taught uh, for 11 and a half years. There's three more things you need to know uh, to make some sense of today's talk. In Australia, we have a thing called uh, Big M milk. You have flavoured milk here as well, right? Uh, so this is a Big M milk, contains empty, this one. Uh, and to promote milk in Australia and get people to drink a lot of flavoured milk... Uh, hello, Linda. Oh, I'll start again. Sorry, I'll go back. <laughs> um, not to embarrass Linda, who's no, coming. No, 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 nothing no, like no, that. No, 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 no. it's a long way from the country to get to here. I know, I know. <laughs> uh, so this is a thing called a Big M. We call it Big M in Australia. They're still there in Australia. Big M milk. You can get it, uh, and you can drink it. Uh, another thing you need to know is there's a radio station. Oops, that's Big M. Another thing you need to know is uh, there is a radio station, a very popular radio station in Melbourne called Triple M. Okay, it's 105.5. You can go on the internet and have a listen. Uh, you heard the, a sample of the music on earlier. And the other thing you need to know is about the angels. Okay, so uh, you might have heard of the angels, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to let them introduce themselves for about one minute. So you're going to have to bear with us while I introduce themselves and if technology allows this to happen. So you have most of the details, the contextual details are important. Um, so one day, uh, when I was teaching at East Doncaster High School, I'd just finished uh, physical education, a class down in the gymnasium, and I had to walk from the gymnasium up to the lower quadrangle at our school. There were two quadrangles. And uh, as I was walking up with the rest of the students and chasing them after their phys ed lesson to get, make sure they got to their math lesson and all that other very interesting stuff, I heard a call across the uh, courtyard, uh, Mr. Clark, Mr. Clark. And uh, I turned around and I saw a girl called Lara Diamond. 
uh, I was uh, I taught her in year seven computer science and physical education and I hadn't taught her since uh, but I had met Lara from time to time because Lara and I were angels fans and so we occasionally would exchange stories about the angels and so and I was busy and I was ready to, I was going to computer science I was going through my head about preparing for the computer science class and Lara said Mr. Clark Mr. Clark uh, are we going to go in the contest and I, I looked at Lara and I said what contest and she said big M and I said big M he said yeah on triple M I said on triple M he said yeah we get a free concert a uh, free concert for the angels and I said, look, Lara, I'm a bit busy at the moment. You have to come back, uh, recess, and we can have a chat about that. But I had to get to class, right? So I went off to class, and I taught two classes quite happily, and I came out of my computer science class, and I'd forgotten about Lara. And here she was standing outside the math staff room, A-block staff room, and uh, we had to rush in and out. There were various things happening. And I said, look, Lara, I've got to get rid of my books. Uh, I'll come back, and I'll see you in a minute. And anyway, I went in the staff room and all those things that happen in staff rooms, the, the math teacher tells you about the meeting on Wednesday and Eberhard's telling me about the Year 7 camp and Miss McClure, who was a very conservative math coordinator, come in and we were sort of quietened down while she walked in. And with her. Anyway, I walked back out in the yard and here's Lara and two of her girlfriends who had standing outside the door and said, OK, Lara, what's this about? She said, well, Mr Clark, on uh, Triple M Radio, the school that collects the most big M labels... And a uh, big M label is actually one of these things. There's actually two on this carton, right? The school that collects the most big M labels is going to win a concert uh, of the angels at their school. And, uh, and that Lara being an angel fan, she was a year 10 student. She wasn't particularly... Um, uh, how can I, she, she didn't stand out academically. She didn't stand out in many ways at all, actually. Uh, and, uh, but here was this young girl. She came up to me and she said, do you think we could go in this contest? So I said to Lara, well... You know, it's a good idea, Lara, and thinking in the back of my mind, our school is a relatively mid-sized high school in Melbourne, and uh, our public schools, we have a very big public school network, by the way, in Melbourne, and some of them have two campuses, Geelong Grammar School and Scotch College, etc., etc. And I'm thinking in the back of my mind, there's very little chance of us actually winning a contest like this. And not only that, I had Tom Burns, who was a principal who was very, very conservative, and uh, I'm thinking, how am I going to get this by Tom, even if we do it? So I said, look, Lara, I have to go and see Mr Burns and have a chat. And so Mr Burns never makes a fast decision, and he always says so. So I remember going into his office and saying, well, Tom, you know, I've got there's this girl called Lara Diamond. He says, I don't know who Lara Diamond. I said, well, she's a, a year 10. She's a, quite a nice student, and uh, she's thinking we should go into a contest uh, and uh, win a concert at our school. And then he sort of asked me what concert. I had to say it was the Angels, and he, and he sort of, you know, one eyebrow went up, you know, and... When I said it was a rock concert on Triple M, you know, both eyebrows go up. And, and I'm thinking, I'm struggling here at the moment. Anyway, Tom, after a conversation with Tom, Tom wanted to know a few more details. I said, look, we'll go and find out some details, Tom, and we'll come back to you. But it doesn't matter if we don't win. It was the start of the year. It was early in the year. Um, it would be good esprit de corps, you know, get the whole school working together around a, a thing. Wouldn't it be fun just to do that? And I knew that, Tom, that would sell Tom, the fact that we'd going to be a school-based thing, right? And uh, so I went out, long story short, Tom actually gave his approval. He thought that would be a good idea because in a couple of weeks it would all dissipate and then we'd all carry on and be <laughs> lovely to start here. Anyway, um, Lara got very excited. I said, yes, Lara, we can do this. And uh, as long as you've got a staff member involved, and I was happy to be involved. And I constricted a couple of my math colleagues. And uh, we were... We, we, Lara started making badges and giving everyone badges and posters and PA announcements every day and all that sort of... She was totally into it. I mean, I, mean, I, was, I saw a different side to Lara. I hadn't seen Lara do this sort of thing. And uh, it went on for about... The, the first week, we were a week late starting. The other schools had started. And on the second week, we'd collected some... I can't remember exactly, but let's say it was 2,500 big M labels. You know. But what, would ha what was happening was this curious thing. Am I talking too fast? Because I'm feeling very nervous up here. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, the Year 11 and Year 12s were too cool to be involved in a Year 10 project, right? Lara's in Year 10. And the Year 9 and 10s were actually involved. And the Year 7 and 8s, we have 7 to 12, uh, were a bit too young, really, to appreciate the angels. They probably would today, uh, back in those days. Uh, they, might, they weren't into it. So we only had the Year 9 and 10s really going full out to collect labels, big M labels. And, and I was having a bit of trouble because they were bringing them to the math staff room and they were starting to smell and because uh, they hadn't been washed properly. And then we got into the garage on the lower quadrangle and we started washing and cutting labels. And Lara had a little team and, and they were wearing their Angels T-shirts, permission for Mr Burns to wear, blah, blah, blah. 
anyway, after about four weeks, uh, the other teams each Saturday night at 7.05 on Triple M, they would announce the school that had reported having the most labels, right? And uh, I remember, uh, but we were so far behind. It was ridiculous, right? And, um, and Friday night, Mark and Silvana and I were in the garage, locking up the garage, and we'd had, I don't know, let's say four and a half, five thousand labels. I can't remember it. No, no, it was actually, it was higher than that. It was like 13,000 labels we'd got to. The winning school the week before had, had, had over 13,000 labels. So we were still a week behind, you know, and it was Geelong Grammar or Marceline College, one of them. Anyway, I went home that night and thought, hey, well, that's all these off now because it, the, the number of labels coming in was starting to really peter off, right? And uh, about seven, ten past seven on Saturday night, my brother rings me and he says, oh, congratulations. And I said, why? He said, you're in front. I said, uh, I don't think so. He said, no, no, you're in front. I said, maybe you're thinking about Doncaster High School, not East Doncaster High School. I was at East Donny and Donny was down the road. And he said, no, 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 they said you've got 20,000 labels. I said, we don't have 20,000, we're 13,000 labels. And he said, well, they just announced it. And so I, I turn up on Monday morning and I walk over to the garage because Mark and uh, Sylvana are already getting things organised for the, that week's collection. And we both sort of, as we arrived at the garage, we sort of looked at each other and Lara appears in the, in, across the quadrangle. And uh, as she comes across, she says, oh, Mr Clark, Mr Clark, and she's carrying two more bags of big M labels. And there's something curious happening around the school, by the way, at the same time. So it, the school has changed. I, I, the garage has now got a small pile of a little mountain of big M containers and labels which we, we didn't anticipate and I've got some year 11s and year 12s dropping off labels like visibly so people can see them so the cool factor has changed right and, um, and, and we said Lara what's going on here? She said well I actually rang Triple M on, the, on Friday night I said, we said you did? She said yeah well I'm not very good at estimating and I remember saying <laughs> I remember saying to her, but Lara, we, we don't have 20,000 labels. And she said, well, and then she looked at the pile of labels. I remember, she said, well, you might have now. <laughs> and I recall thinking, I said, oh, all right, uh, we had a little discussion. And I said, uh, what we should do, let's wait till Friday. If we haven't got 20,000 labels by Friday, we're going to ring up Triple M, tell them we made a mistake, and, and then that, we'll get out of it, right? Well, what happened in the course of the next week? Even Tom Burns started bringing in big M labels. <laughs> I mean, it just took off. It just took off. And uh, we actually collected 35,848 <laughs> labels. You, go, you cannot imagine what that looks like. We actually won the competition and Geelong Graham was upset and everybody else. So we actually won this contest to have that band that you just saw, which was probably the biggest Australian rock band in Australia at the time, come to perform at our high school. And this was no simple event, by the way. We, uh, we found out at the power supply in the high school couldn't, uh, we couldn't run a concert, right? We had to go and up the power supply in the gymnasium just so we could run the concert. Tom Burns was starting to tear his hair up. We had to have the school cordoned off by police so the people wouldn't come in. There was a big debate. We were a, a, we were a uniformed high school. We don't, you don't have that here. And there was a big decision about whether kids should wear casual clothes or wear uniforms. And we decided uniforms was the only way we could distinguish our kids from any other blow-ins which would turn up. It went on and on. Anyway, it was quite an extraordinary event for our little high school to pull off uh, this contest. Uh, we had the contest and uh, I'm going to have to plug in my thing because it's running out of power. And this is a photo of uh, Doc Neeson, the, the lead singer of the Angels. And Lara is the blonde-headed girl in the photo there. And uh, can you imagine what it would be like at that age to stand beside, you know, your rock idol, that, like a huge rock star in Australia? I mean, it's, it's quite an extraordinary thing. When, when I look back on it now, I mean, I've told this story many times, but I've always told it from the point of view of we had the angels at our school, right? And uh, it's only recently that I, I went back and I thought, why do I keep telling... Why is this story intriguing to me as a teacher, as an educator? Why is this interesting? <laughs> And, I mean, this is a beautiful, beautiful photograph, as it turns out. And I only dug that. I was surprised I still had that. What I, the point I'm getting at, I guess, is... Uh, so teachers' lives are full of stories that shape and determine who they are and what they do. And if you look at all these dots, these might be the stories... We all have stories like this. We have stories every day. I mean, they, they're, they're changing. Uh, even old people like me, we have new stories every day. What I'm curious about... and. Uh, and the question I was going to, how might Lara's story be a form of teacher inquiry? I mean, I've just told you this lovely story. It's a fun story. It was a fun time when we did it. But why is it? Why might that be a story of teacher inquiry? And if it was a room full of um, graduate students, which I thought it might be, um, I was going to ask you to try and problem solve that. 
what would change this from being an interesting story that you'd put in the paper about East Doncaster High School won the Angels concert to being a story about teacher inquiry and to spare you the, the, the agony of trying to go through that mm-hmm. you've probably got better ideas than I have actually uh, and, and this is where I want to move on to now is uh, to note a couple of things and uh, some of you might be well, we will be familiar with this in any case uh, all of us are expected to have scholarly approaches to teaching and learning. You all, all of us educators are expected to go into the classroom with a knowledge of our area and the knowledge of the, the practices that are going on in our area, the new pedagogical practices, etc. Okay? That would be having a scholarly approach to teaching and learning. Uh, the difference for a teacher inquiry, it actually says we're going to engage in the scholarship of teaching and learning. We're actually going to study teaching and learning in particular ways. So that's an, a very important distinction. Uh, we're expected to do that, but this is another area, another domain that we might actually start exploring. And I want you to keep thinking of the angel story. Why is it not just a story about a rock band at a school? Uh, another important here is the scholarship of teaching and learning. Really, what is being told when it's interrogated and then it's shared? These would be at least three important parts that would change this story of the angel's concert to something else, potentially a, a story about teacher inquiry. So Lyra's story is a form of teacher inquiry and as we start to think about stories of practice they start to take on different forms in different shapes. There are different categories of stories, there are different types of stories. Things mean different things to different people in different contexts. And the story that I'm telling you today is for this particular context. I've actually started doing the telling. Actually in the telling I've also done some of the interrogation and also I've, I've, I've briefly started to share with you what that might look like. I've actually tried to write this and found out how difficult it was to write teacher inquiry, how to do teacher inquiry. Uh, I wouldn't, wouldn't recommend you go and look at it, by the way. Uh, <laughs> the story was much better, it comes out. What I'd like to do in the next few minutes then, and, and not take up any more of your time, is to talk about five things in relation to teacher inquiry that might be of interest to you if, you, if you're engaged in it or if you are engaging in it already. Okay? And we're going to run down these and have a look at them. Good revisionist history for some of us. Uh, what I want to say is that uh, there's lots of names for this sort of activity and, and people are going to make quite sharp distinctions between some of these things. I think some of that's unnecessary, but be that as it may, we're in academia and some language is important, right? Um, in, in, in the big school that we're at now, they like to put capital letters on it called the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. Um, it's still teacher inquiry in many ways. Uh, there's other... I mean, this was an early one. Uh, this is more recent self-study, etc., etc. Uh, what I want to say is all these constitute uh, the scholarship of teaching and learning in some way, shape or form. And you weren't always allowed to do this at the university. It's only a fairly recent event. Uh, for old people, recent is more <laughs> elastic than for younger people. Uh, but we'll explore that in a minute. What I'd like to do then is put this all into some sort of perspective. Okay? And you can challenge me on this if you like. If we looked at the timeline, this being recent, 2000, even though it's now 15 years ago, 14 years ago, what I want to say is, back in these days, uh, I wasn't here in these days. Were you here these days? No, probably not. Um, <laughs> Beth was only born about here. Right? Uh, <laughs> uh, re- <laughs> research on pupils. Uh, we, were, it was, it was, we were looking at pupils and it was experimental research back in those days. Well, not a lot of it. Moving along, I, I once used to draw this diagram with this arrow stopping but I've actually redrawn it now because this still continues. I want to say, I'm not saying that they replace each other, right? This sort of research. Robert, you've seen all, you see, you read all these proposals. You know exactly what this is all about. Uh, around about this time period was research on teachers. We started actually examining teachers. We went out in the classrooms and watched them. We didn't talk to them very much, but we did research on teachers. Experimental and quasi-experimental. Um, this is like, this is like a, uh, a master seminar. Uh, then we did research with teachers. Uh, teacher thinking was an example of that. Okay, uh, and it, it was about around about this area, this time period that this started being introduced. Increasing use of qualitative research methods in education. They've been used a lot elsewhere, but we were starting to come down from our high horse, attempting to go in that that, that very rarefied area of the hard sciences, and moving down into into understanding the the relevance of practice. And then my argument is that uh, around about this period, and I'll try and support this in a minute. Uh, This is research by teachers. We actually said that if teachers did the research, this would constitute genuine, authentic research in much the same way that the rest of us did it. I mean, and this did coincide with the emergence of these sort of methodologies uh, in in research. To support some of that argument that this is sort of the recent 
of the recent time. Uh, there was a lovely book called Chemist and Car called Becoming Critical, which really talked about action research back in that. This was, and this was a really interesting time period. Uh, Boyer did the Scholarship Reconsidered, and which was the first part of scholarship of teaching and learning. It took a while to take off, but that's there. Uh, Cochrane... Uh, Smith, Smith and Lytle did this beautiful book called Inside Outside, if you haven't read it and you're interested in doing teacher research um, it's a, just a beauty, it's fantastic uh, there's lots of things you could add here, this was an interesting one, the self-study of teacher education practices uh, first came into AERA in 1993 I mean it really, really, so when you start to look at it, I'm not a historian but it's quite interesting to see what happens, more importantly though uh, <laughs> in 1998 actually one of the first universities to be so far ahead of its time, I remember Galen started this, Galen Erickson, he actually said we need needed a forum that allows teachers to inquire into their practice and actually recognise it. I mean, Galen was quite a... When you think about it, back in 1998, it's now been going for 17 years, that was quite amazing. We still have people coming to that conference thinking, we should do this at our university. And we've been doing it for 17 years, thanks to Galen Erickson. I want to go on to uh, the important proviso uh, in relation to this. Uh, contrary to some of my colleagues in the fields of teaching inquiry, in uh, this challenge of the self-study uh, AER recently, I was shot down today uh, recently, which is, which is interesting. I argue for a broad view of what constitutes the public. This is the shared part. Uh, my colleagues in self-study, some of them, not all of them, argue that it needs to be um, a published paper. I suggest that the shared uh, doesn't have to be a published paper. We have lovely examples here, by the way, at UBC. This is called uh, Teacher Research in the Backyard, Carl Lego and Gang up at Kitimat. Beautiful set of stories about teachers, teacher inquiry. Stunning. Okay, they, they published themselves. Huh? BCTF put that out. Uh, you don't have to be in journals. Um, a small school down the road, the little school that could, uh, Livingston Elementary, did a lovely thing on um, smart boards. I mean, and uh, we, they published them, that themselves pretty much. Uh, those sorts of things are extraordinary. But I believe that even if I talk to uh, Bly Frank myself, that that's making public my practice. That constitutes the public. And so I argue and encourage people, and when you go out, this, my line was, but when you all go out to be professors, but half of you already are professors, uh, when you, we go out and you have to su uh, support and encourage young people who want to do masters and doctoral degrees, and they might want to engage in their own practice, you now are responsible for saying, here's a pot, one possible way of engaging in research. It's not easy to supervise this research, by the way. Um, not easy to supervise any research. Okay, thank you. Um, where am I going on this? Um, um, did I go backwards? Though? What I want to say is uh, this is about making explicit. That's what I tried to do today. And by the way, writing that story has just about killed me because I had to, you had to work out what you're going to bring to the front and what goes to the back. It, I've tried to do a deliberate examination. Uh, the critical point for me is in the story that I told you was I started to talk about Lara. More, every time I sold the story, Lara became a more and more, more, more important part of the story. And I, I was, why was that the case? And, and I, in, the, in the article I make the argument that, that I began to realise, and it took me a long time to realise this, and I should have done more about it at the time. I taught physical education, mathematics and computer science in the high school. That's what I was trained to do, that's what the ministry employed me to do. But I honestly came to the opinion after 11 and a half years of teaching that was 50% of the things that I did in high school. The other 50% had to do with attending to the educative agenda of what it was to, of being in the world for those young people. Uh, it was a high school, so it wasn't a religious school, but I thought we had to talk about it. What we did in our practice, we talked about honesty. I mean, I remember coming second so many times at the all-high competition and making my poor girls' volleyball team walk across and shake the hands of the people who came first because it was so important. Now, that's not necessarily in mathematics, computer science, or the education curriculum set up by the schools, right? Uh, it, it is more and more today. But that's the educative agenda instead of the system of schooling. I think the story of Lara made me more aware of the educative agenda. And by telling the story and interrogating it, uh, I began to understand the shift in my practice about teaching and the shared knowledge which, which I've tried to do today. So teacher inquiry can be retrospective, it can be current, and it could be anticipatory, by the way, uh, but we don't need to go into all those things at the moment. And the most controversial... Uh, I want to revisit Schwab, and some of you already know what I want to say about this, so you start throwing things already. Um, I'm, I don't know why I keep going back to these old people, eh? Schwab, 1973. Um, he said, for teaching to serve as someone, a teacher must be teaching someone, a student, about something, a curriculum at some place. He called it the milieu. Uh, pretty obvious stuff, huh? I mean, it is today. 
Back in those days, this was fairly, ra fairly radical. He was actually bringing the practical to the fore in ways that hadn't been done, that schools and schools uh, and researchers had sort of removed themselves from the practical. What do we call these, by the way? That was my question. Anybody? Anybody? The four? Come on. Anybody? Linda, help me out. I need someone to... Commonplace, thank you very much. Four commonplaces. I oh, know you're just humouring me, the rest of you. Uh, these are called the four commonplaces of teaching. A really, really important stuff, by the way. Uh, really, really critical. And Schwab, but we should go back and uh, read Schwab more often. Uh, I'm not a Schwabian scholar, but uh, one, of, one of our most wonderful professors, Walt Werner, was, by the way. Um, I would suggest, and I arrogantly suggest the Schwab is only partly correct. Well, why not? He's not here. Or well, maybe he's looking down. He's saying, well, who is that idiot in 310? <laughs> I'm sure he's in heaven. Um, I, su I suggest uh, that there's another important commonplace that characterised professional practice in schools and I call it the somehow uh, we do all the other sums, I call it the somehow it's the way that teachers explore make sense of and improve their practice I argue that you can have all these four but this somehow is absolutely critical to professional practice and I'm going to go on to that in a minute I call this somehow teacher inquiry and so all the work that I try to do in schools is actually engage teachers in teacher inquiry. Why? Because unless teachers inquire into the practice, that is, they seek to understand why they do what they do, their practice ceases to be professional. Okay, that's really important. Their practice ceases to be professional. It becomes perfunctory, routinized, and duplicative. Okay, so I can copy, I can copy Robert or I, I, but if I'm only copying Robert, then my practice is not professional. So I argue for, to teachers in schools that unless you're inquiring into your practice, your practice is not professional. Now, you probably know of teachers yourself. If you think back, you can probably think of teachers who you thought weren't very good teachers. My argument is they probably cease to be inquisitive about their practice. They probably cease to be curious about their practice, and they probably cease to engage in any, in any sort of inquiry. So this is really important for me. Inquiry is a defining feature of professional practice and distinguishes professional practice from labour or technical work. If you don't inquire into your practice, you might as well be a technician, you might as well be a labourer. You put your stuff down at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you go home, you come back at 9 o'clock the next morning and you just start off again. Okay? I remember a teacher saying to me when I was doing my student teaching rounds at Rosanna East High School uh, that you should go home at the end of each day and don't take school with you. And I thought, oh, I was really feeling bad. I was taking school home with me. I was thinking about it. And I've come to realise all these years later, but they're actually quite a good thing. Not 100% of the time, but you don't just leave it and pick it up, leave it and pick it up. Um, so uh, teacher inquiry, I think, is a tiny feature of professional practice in schools. And that's where I wanted to get to at the end. Have I got through them all yet or is there another one? I think that's it. That's it. <sighs> I spoke very fast. Thank you very much for your patience. That's all I have to say. Uh, I borrowed it from everybody else. Um, but I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.